And we are back. And just as we started the program back in March uh, with Dr. Stanley Martin, the director of infectious disease at Geisinger, we felt like we needed to go back to him for an update on our current situation. Good morning, Dr. Martin. Good morning. Um, so we haven't spoken in three months and a lot has happened in that time. Um, and I don't know if you'll dispute this or not, but not so much in our area. Do you agree with that? I mean, did we were we relatively spared from this? Well, we certainly did not have uh, the enormous surge uh, in central PA that we saw in, uh, and are seeing in a lot of other areas of the country, right? Uh, I think we had a pretty timely intervention uh, with uh, putting in protective measures in place that combined with the fact that you know we're in a more rural environment uh, kind of helps spare us from getting hit really hard like we saw in other areas of the East Coast and, and dense urban areas, particularly New York, of course. You did have, still have um, 500 people who are hospitalized and discharged. Yeah, in fact, actually we're getting close to 600 now. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So you still continue to see patients? Of course. And Pennsylvania, you know, despite the fact that, uh, that we have done uh, a great job of flattening that curve, as we, as we, as we said, right? Uh, I mean, Pen the state of Pennsylvania continues to see, you know, roughly 500 new cases a day. Uh, now, that's a far cry from the peak we were at in April. I think our biggest one day count in, in April was something like 2,300. Uh, so we've come down quite a bit from then, uh, but we still have it, right? We still have over 30 patients in the hospital throughout the Geisinger system with COVID. We continue to admit patients to the hospital every day with COVID, although again, numbers now much smaller than they, they used to be. The symptoms pretty much holding true still today from than they were back in March and April? So yeah, that's a, a good question. Certainly, we know that the, the most common symptoms, uh, the, the fever, the cough, the shortness of breath, those still are the dominant symptoms that we see with the sick people who have COVID. But we also note now that there has been uh, 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 probably a, a list of other symptoms that tend to be maybe uh, a little milder, uh, things like chills, uh, things like headache, things like even uh, nausea or abdominal pain or diarrhea, which isn't maybe that frequent, but can happen and can still sometimes be a, a clue that the person may have COVID. We've also learned a lot about um, asymptomatic infection since we last talked, right? And we know that this illness is essentially a spectrum. And although we see the really sick people showing up in the hospital, there's lots of people with milder symptoms who are not necessarily being admitted to the hospital. And of course, there's people who are hardly symptomatic at all, have very mild symptoms, who aren't even showing up in a doctor's office, right? Or who don't have symptoms at all. And to what amount, how much uh, the disease that accounts for is still a little bit unclear. It's difficult to put your finger on, but you know, some people estimate it's you know maybe as much as 20 to 50 percent. Now, is that something that could be determined with antibody tests? And is there a reliable test for that out there? So that's also a good question, right? So antibody tests are tests which look to see if you have a protein in your blood which has been made by your immune system as a response to an infection, right? And we do antibody tests all the time for all sorts of different types of infections. Uh, COVID is, is not unique in that situation. But antibody tests uh, can vary in terms of their quality, let's just say that. And COVID, again, is no different. A lot of the tests that have been developed for antibodies aren't particularly helpful, um, and some of them are, are better than others. And the FDA is, I think, struggling a little bit with trying to uh, put their finger on uh, controlling some of the quality when it comes to these tests. Uh, but some of them are good uh, in terms of picking up very specific antibodies. 
And uh, again, all they can really tell us is that a person has been exposed to the virus. It doesn't tell us that they have it. It doesn't tell us when they had it. Um, and it doesn't tell us even necessarily that they now have anything resembling immunity, which is, of course, what most of us would hope an antibody test might indicate. Because there's some question, is there some question still at this time that getting the virus will make you immune, immune from it in the future? Right. Uh, we, we'd like to think that there's some immunity that you get after being infected by the virus, and there probably is. Uh, but what is the durability of that immunity, if it exists, is really the question, right? Um, with some infections, immunity can last a lifetime, right? I mean, if you had measles as a child, you're probably immune for the rest of your life. Uh, but with a lot of respiratory viruses, immunity can wane fairly quickly, uh, maybe as quickly as three months, uh, maybe it's six months, maybe it's 12 months. I, we don't really know just yet with, with COVID. So as far as determining those, those people out there who are asymptomatic, uh, antibody tests, would that become a regular thing as we head into the future here to try to, to, try to figure out where this stands? Or is yeah. testing and tracing still the way to go? Testing for active infection and tracing is still very much um, the, the priority. Antibody tests, if they're done, basically only can tell you a percentage of a population that's been exposed. So it can be helpful from an epidemiological standpoint, as we say, right? It can, it can give you a sense of the degree of exposure that's happened in maybe in a certain community. As far as helping an individual patient, eh, not so much. So are you guys still doing testing on a fairly large scale? Yes, we do quite a large number of tests. Uh, we're, we're able to do thousands of tests now at this point. Uh, our lab has scaled up considerably. How do you do, are you doing them, do you seek out in the clinical setting or do you have t testing set up somewhere? We do have testing centers that are still set up. We had uh, more of them during uh, the initial kind of surge that we were experiencing here in central PA. Since that's died down, we have scaled back some of those testing centers, um, but we still have them. We understand and recognize that there is a risk we could experience another surge at some point and uh, be ready to kind of scale that back up if we need to. Do you know offhand uh, any numbers on the percentages of how many how many people you test turn out negative as opposed to positive? Uh, yes, I could. T I think we've done so far uh, almost forty thousand tests. Wow! Uh, in the Geisinger system, um, and of the ones that have come back, the resulted. Uh, I think I'm looking at a number here. About thirty six hundred have been positive. Okay. Um, so a little less than 10%. So that's still a, f a fair number of people who actually turn out being negative. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, so we, try to, we try to have a, a low threshold for, for testing somebody, right? You know, a patient comes to the hospital. I'm having trouble with my breathing. We're going to test you for COVID, right? Now, odds are it's not going to be COVID. It might be something else, right? Maybe it's your heart. Maybe it's some other lung problem. But we want to make sure. What's interesting is, is that there are still symptoms out there for, I guess, other viruses or other diseases that are leading people to feel like they need to get tested. Yeah, and that certainly can be, as this time of year, people start to experience a lot of seasonal allergies, right? Uh, and, you know, if you have cough, runny nose, congestion, is that just your allergies? Is it COVID? That can be difficult to distinguish sometimes. Obviously, fever would be definitely a red flag for COVID. Um, as far as other respiratory viruses go, though this is the time of year, we're lucky that this is the time of year when we see the, the smaller amount of, of other respiratory viruses, right? Um, this is, of course, one of our concerns as we look to the fall, right? Because as we look to the fall, we know that influenza will be coming back around the corner, right? Because it does every year. 
Um, and you can't distinguish flu from COVID just by the patient's symptoms. Um, and so uh, trying to manage flu season at the same time we're wrestling with COVID is gonna be a challenge. And this is one of the reasons why this year it will be particularly important that everybody, and yes, I mean everybody, gets their flu shot. <laughs> so, yeah, you brought up something. Um, number one, um, do we expect this to still be around in the fall, obviously, and um, do we expect it to be worse during the fall? Yeah. Um, we do expect it to be around in the fall. Um, it's not going away anytime soon. Uh, we don't have an evac. We don't have a vaccine for this infection yet, right? Uh, although there's reason to be optimistic about that because there are uh, at least three vaccines in the United States that are into what we would call phase three clinical trials. This is where you're actually giving it to real people to see if it's preventing actual infection, right? Um, so you have to jump through a lot of hoops just to even get to that, that point. Um, so it's, it's very conceivable we'll have a vaccine come 2021, but the fall we'll still be struggling with this virus and we're nowhere near what we would call herd immunity, right? Herd immunity is the concept where you have enough people in a community who are immune to an infection so that the people that are in that community, the small number of people in that community that are not immune are still protected because they're part of the bigger herd, right? Um, we're not there yet with COVID. Um, you know, some estimates think that we need maybe 60, 70% of a population to be immune to this virus in order to have herd immunity. And we're nowhere near that. Even if you look at a place like New York City, which had a huge outbreak, of course, of COVID, as everybody knows. Uh, when they did those antibody studies we were talking about earlier in some of those neighborhoods, you're looking at maybe 15, maybe to 20% seropositive at the most, right? So not close to that amount of herd immunity you need. So yes, we will be contending with this come the fall. Um, to what degree? I don't know. I, you know, I left my crystal ball at home uh, today, uh, unfortunately. Uh, you know, I would love to be able to forecast the future, but um, uh, the fall presents a particular challenge because uh, of schools in particular um, and because of weather, people being back inside. Um, you compound that with the onset of the flu season, et cetera. It, it, it could be a uh, it could be a challenge for all of us. Okay, quickly dispel a myth for me: the flu shot will not protect you from this. That's right. So the influenza virus is a different virus than the than the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID. Right? Uh, they're not even in the same family of viruses. Um, and so the vaccine you get for the flu will not necessarily protect you from COVID. Um, so it's important that you get the flu shot, but unfortunately it's, it, it's not gonna necessarily protect you from COVID. And are we looking at the potential that any vaccine that is eventually cleared to use could be one that we have to either get a booster for like a month down the road or just get on a yearly basis like the flu? That's highly conceivable. Um, there's a lot that we don't know about that yet. Uh, but yes, that, that would strike me as a very uh, reasonable probability. Because there are so, are there so many different strains of COVID right now out there? <laughs> well, maybe. It depends on who you ask. Uh, you know, and this can be, uh, uh, this is debatable about what counts as a different strain of COVID versus just a slight variation. Uh, you know, when you're starting to look at genetics of these viruses and, you know, this one has a little bit of DNA, which is slightly different. Uh, even the people who are real expert virologists argue over what that might mean and what counts as, as a different strain. Uh, as far as we know, from a clinical standpoint, uh, we, we don't see anything significant as of yet. Um, and getting back to the patients you've seen, you've had 
from what I understand, one child with this condition called MISC. I'm not going to give the name because I don't know it. Um, and that, that's up to, up to this point, that's it, right? Yeah, the multi-inflammatory system syndrome, yes. So this is a, uh, a very uh, strange uh, inflammatory phenomena that can uh, happen in some children uh, with COVID. Um, and by children, we're also including, you know, uh, teenagers and even young adults, people who are in that 18 to maybe even early 20s range. Uh, but certainly teenagers uh, and some children as well. This can be a very severe disease when it happens, uh, causing all sorts of multi-organ failure, heart failure, respiratory failure, et cetera. It's, 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 it's very uh, severe. Uh, thankfully, kids tend to be healthy and pretty resilient, right? And uh, with the proper expertise um, uh, and care, uh, a lot of them have done pretty well. Okay, here's the big question, and I know you don't have your crystal ball. <laughs> You've already said that. Um, a lot of what's going on in the, across the country, uh, we're seeing enormous spikes, Texas, Florida, California. Yeah. Is that still the first wave, <laughs> or, or are we talking about a second wave here? Yeah, I, I, I don't know what uh, – that may be semantics if we talk about what's a wave versus, versus not. Uh, but uh, a lot of these states uh, did not implement uh, in a timely manner the kind of things we know need to be done in order to try to prevent these kinds of large-scale outbreaks. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's been very consequential. I think Thursday, uh, we saw the largest number cases in the United States reported in one day, well over 39,000 cases. Um, you know, uh, that tells you that COVID hasn't gone anywhere, right? Um, and uh, once you reach a certain point, it, it becomes very difficult to kind of put that genie back into the, the bottle. And uh, these states are, are really struggling, unfortunately. So perhaps a consequence of reopening too quickly? Yeah, or are never really implementing some of the measures that we know uh, help prevent that uh, kind of uh, outbreak, um, like the like the social distancing, like the mask wearing in, in public, like the uh, you know diligent hand hygiene um, and uh, limiting gatherings uh, of people in particular. Uh, let's talk about masks for a second, because I, I honestly have never seen an issue quite like this one. <laughs> um, how long do you think we're going to be wearing masks? <laughs> Those of us who do. <laughs> uh, well, until we have herd immunity, uh, right? Uh, until we have a, uh, a population where we have enough immunity that the risk of spread in the community is is significantly decreased. Um, and so when is that going to be? Uh, I would guess that's not going to be until we have a vaccine available. Um, it seems clear based on uh, a lot of the studies that have been done trying to look at what measures are the most effective at preventing spread in the community and uh, wearing a mask in public is probably the most effective intervention that we can do as a society uh, to prevent the spread of the virus. Um, so it's hard to see masking going away anytime soon. Um, just real quick, get your opinion on something, because um, I have read this, I've read articles on this, uh, that there are scientists, doctors out there who believe that the virus is weakening. And I just wanted to get your take on this. I saw one Italian researcher said that, and I know there's another facility in Pennsylvania that has said that, that has doctors that have said that. Well, I don't know of anybody who's who said that. There's certainly no studies uh, to support that per se. Um, I think, uh, you know, initially when you looked at the outbreak, all we really saw was kind of the tip of the iceberg, right? The people who were really sick. Um, and in fact, if you go all the way back to Wuhan, China, when this first outbreak first started out, 
they were reporting a mortality rate of something like 10%, right? Meaning one in 10 people who had the infection were dying. Uh, now, it was clear that that was a warped perception, right? Because it was skewed. The, the only people that they knew about with the infection were the people who were the sickest people because they were the ones in the hospital. They were the ones who were getting tested, right? Now we see that this infection is, is much deeper and broader than that, and it encompasses a larger number of people, many of whom have much milder symptoms. And we now know that the mortality rate is actually much less than that, right? It's probably closer to 1% or even less. Um, so it, it's not that there's been necessarily a, a weakening of the virus. It's I think we've just learned more about, um, we have a more accurate understanding of it. How's that? Sounds good to me. Uh, so Geisinger continues to advance to continue to ease its restrictions. Uh, I think I saw yesterday you're now allowing two patients to, to go in and visit patients. Yes, we, 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 to visit patients. we try to, you know, we, we want to be very conscious of, you know, families and, uh, you know, you have people who are sick in the hospital. These are family members, some of them, of course, even dying, uh, you know, and to try to, you uh, keep people out of the hospital is, is fraught with, with problems. You know, that's, nobody wants to be in those kinds of circumstances. Um, and so as the numbers have come down, we have really tried to be on top of this and looked at ways to try to make sure we can get people to be able to come in to safely visit their family. Uh, and that's the key, safe, right? We want to, the doors haven't been blown wide open, right? We still want to try to do this in as safe a manner as, as possible. And as, as long as the numbers permit that, we're going to continue in that vein as best we can. How, I, I imagine at this point, you must be pretty proud of how your colleagues have handled this whole situation. Uh, I am, actually. I have to tell you, um, it was, uh, it's been very stressful um, for everybody. Uh, I, you know, I mean, as a nation, I think we've been stressed, um, you know, and certainly a lot of my colleagues in healthcare have, have been stressed as well. Uh, but, you know, we all recognized, I think, that there's a job to do. And I think um, we've come a long way in, in learning about this virus and how to handle it. You know, we've, we, we, we made it through that, that big surge of patients and we, we learned a lot about what we need to do in order to, to do that. And so I think if we do wind up seeing another large surge come through, let's say in the fall, um, I think we will be even better prepared uh, for it from that standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> well put. As before in March, you eloquently summed it up very well. So Dr. Stanley Martin, we'll leave you on that note. We thank you very much for your time this morning. You're very welcome. Thank you, Chris. And we want to thank Dr. Stanley Martin, the Director of Infectious Disease with the Geisinger Health System, for his always incredible insight and information. And that's going to do it for this episode of In Your Neighborhood. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Chris O'Rourke. We'll see you again next time. Stay safe out there.